Welcome to Manifest, hosted by international evangelist, teacher, and author Perry Stone. Enjoy unique insight into prophetic and practical truth. It's time to feast on fresh manna, so get ready to be blessed and encouraged. And now, here is your host and teacher, Perry Stone. Welcome to Jerusalem today on Manifest here at the beautiful Olive Tree Hotel. You know, last week we shared with you part one of a series that I want to continue part two today as we're dealing with the Apocalypse Code, breaking the Apocalypse Code, understanding the book of Revelation. I know there's been a lot of teaching done over the years on the book, and to be quite honest with you, there's numerous opinions, but today... Here on Manifest, we're going to cover the subject from a different perspective. I'm going to be talking about the symbolism that's used in apocalyptic literature, such as the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation, and why God uses symbolism to speak. One of the things when I was a young preacher, and I began to study the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation, one of the things I asked the Lord was, why did you speak in symbolism? Couldn't you just have made it plain? Well, you have to understand something, that when the book of Revelation was written, there were certain things that these prophets were seeing that did not exist at that particular time. And so for them to try to detail an explanation of something that would exist or occur in the future, but did not exist at that time, that's one of the reasons symbolism is used. But let's talk about that today. First of all, let me share something with you. How God has spoken in the past. In the book of Genesis, chapter 22 and verse 17, God, when he speaks uses heavenly and earthly elements to reveal truth. He said to Abraham, I will make your seed as the stars of heaven and as the sand of the sea. You can't count either one of those. You can't number them. But see, stars are heavenly and sand is earthly. God says you're going to have an earthly seed, that would be the Jewish people, and you're going to have a heavenly seed, that would be those who would enter into a redemptive covenant through Christ. Here's another example of how God has spoke. Genesis chapter 41, 2 through uh, ch beginning at chapter 2 all the way through that chapter God begins to use symbolism of things that people were familiar with in the dream that Pharaoh had God used stalks of grain and cattle two things that the Egyptians were completely familiar with and then he shared with Joseph the interpretation of the dream a third example is this Genesis Daniel chapter 7 verses 1 through 6 God uses symbolism and he reveals that symbolism using the, 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 the different characters of animals in prophetic symbolism. Now this is one of the odd things, to be quite honest with you, about Bible prophecy, how in the book of Daniel, for example, when Daniel was talking about the different prophetic empires that would exist, he talked about in Daniel chapter 7 how that there was a lion with two eagle's wings, how there was a bear with three ribs in its mouth, and how that there was a leopard with four wings on its back. And of course, when you look at that, he's not talking about a literal lion, literal bear, literal leopard. It's symbolism. And yet that, the symbolism, which is very interesting, if you go back to the historical setting of that day, you can discover why he used the symbolism. For example, winged lions, and there was a particular name given to them, were used to guard the entrance of the palaces of Babylon. Now, not a literal lion with wings, but a carved image. Now, the Persian... Persian country, the country of Persia back in Daniel's time was known for its large vicious bears. And of course the leopard represents the swiftness of Alexander the Great. So this is how God speaks. He uses things people are familiar with, makes them symbolism. He uses the characteristics in the nature of animals and produces apocalyptic symbolism. He uses earthly and heavenly things, such as even cosmic signs, to speak to mankind in the form of biblical symbolism. Now let's go a step further. In the book of Revelation, it is called the book of Revelation. Some people say book of Revelations, but it's not Revelations, plural. I've heard that said for years. It's Revelation singular, one revelation consisting of 22 chapters. When John saw it, it literally was a one scroll. It didn't have chapter and verse headings, and it was a continual revelation beginning with the revelation of Jesus Christ in chapter 1 all the way to chapter 22 where the new heaven and the new earth are created and the new Jerusalem comes down to, to be among men. Now, having said that, it is very, very clear when you read the book, book of Revelation that it has veiled symbolism in it. But the one thing that's very important for you to understand concerning the symbolism is this, that the biblical symbolism will always interpret itself. 
Before I go into that, let me share some things I have in my notes here that I want to be able to share with you. How does what we call apocalyptic symbolism occur? And what do we mean by apocalyptic symbolism or apoc apocalyptic prophecies? Apocalyptic prophecies are things which are hidden that deal with the time of the end. Now, two of the strongest books in, the, in our Bible are the book of Daniel from the Old Testament and the book of Revelation from the New Testament that deal with what we call the time of the end. As a matter of fact, in the book of Daniel, the, word, the phrase time of the end is used five times in the book of Daniel. And in those references, it alludes to the time period of man's government on earth when certain activities are going to be taking place prior to the Messiah returning to the earth to physically set up his kingdom, which is mentioned, by the way, in Zechariah chapter 14 and also Revelation chapter 19, among other verses of the Bible. Now, in the book of Daniel, there's a lot of symbolism used concerning the empires of prophecy. In the book of Revelation, there's a lot of individual symbolism used. For example, the lamb, all but one example, represents Christ. The serpent represents Satan. The dragon, of course, in the Bible, uh, is, is the word used in the book of Revelation, representing Satan. And that Greek word, dracon, actually translates as a keen seeing serpent, a serpent with very keen eyes, with an ability to see things. So these are symbolisms that are used in the Bible. And once again, we're going to ask ourselves this question, why God speaks through symbolism? We do know that he uses dreams. We find this in Daniel 7, verse 1. We do know he uses visions. Revelation chapter 1, 10, uh, chapter 1, beginning at verse 10 through chapter 22. John has an entire vision on the Isle of Patmos. We know, according to uh, the Bible, he uses angels. Angels bring visitations from heaven and words from heaven. They bring apocalyptic messages. In fact, we read about that uh, throughout the book of Daniel. So, God has different methods to bring messages to people, especially the prophets of the Bible, to reveal to them events which are going to happen in what is called the time of the end or, 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 or the end of time. Now, let me just go on down here and just begin to share some, some of the ideas concerning the symbolism that is used, for example, in the book of Daniel. One of the interesting uh, teach, teachings that we have done over the years is from Daniel chapter 2 where King Nebuchadnezzar had that amazing vision of that metallic image. Now you've heard us talk about this for many years over manifest. The head was of gold, the chest and arms were of silver, the hips were brass, the legs were iron. As, and, and as you go from the knees downward, the legs become a mixture of iron and clay, the feet become a mixture of iron and clay, and then there are ten toes, which are a mixture of ceramic clay and iron. Now, the question that I always had as a young minister when I read that is, why did God choose these metals? Now, we know that Babylon had a huge amount of gold, but I would later find out that the Medes and Persians, which are, sig which are signified by the chest and arms of silver, used silver to collect their tax money. Taxes were paid in silver. And some of the Persians had silver harnesses on their horses. Brass was the emblem of, of Greece and Alexander the Great because the, the Greeks used brass weapons in their warfare. Rome was a kingdom of iron, iron chariots, iron spears, iron swords. And of course, when you come down to the end of days, there's a mixture of iron and ceramic clay. We won't deal with that today on Manifest uh, as in, begin to talk about this for just a moment because it's interesting that when God gave Nebuchadnezzar this dream of this image with the metal from going from gold all the way down to iron and clay, that in the 8th century, there was a Greek poet, his sword, that divided the humanity up into five ages. Now listen to this. Consisting of gold, silver, bronze, and iron. In other writings, now this is way back before Daniel wrote the book of Daniel. In other writings, the world's spiritual history was divided into gold, silver, steel, and mixed iron ages, moving from the age of revelation, scholars have noted, to the age of apostasy. Now let's go back to the book of Revelation because we're dealing today with this book and some of the symbolism which is in it. We find in the book of Revelation chapter 1 verse 12 there's a symbol of a candlestick called a golden candelabra. We know by reading the book it represents the seven churches which are mentioned in the book of Revelation chapter 2 and 3. We have a symbolism in Revelation chapter 1 verse 16 which are seven stars in Christ's right hand. We know that those are the pastors or the messengers of those seven churches mentioned in Revelation chapters uh, 2 and 3, which are seven major cities where seven churches existed in the time of the early church. We find in Revelation chapter 5 and verse 6, there's a lamb with seven eyes and seven horns. The lamb here 
represents Jesus Christ. The horns represent his authority. The eyes represent the fact that his eyes go up throughout the entire earth. And oddly enough, we know today that there are seven continents on the face of the earth. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 3, there's a dragon with seven heads and ten horns. You look at the Greek word dragon and you know what it means. It means a, it actually is a word for serpent. It is a serpent and it represents none other than Satan. In Revelation chapter 12, 1 and 2, there's a woman in travail in heaven who's giving birth. And this represents the nation of Israel when you compare it to Joseph's dream in the book of uh, Genesis. Revelation 17 and 7, there's a woman riding a beast with seven heads and ten horns. This is a false religious system that rises at the end of days. So the interesting thing is, here's the main point about symbolism. I want everybody to hear this because this is very, very important you hear it. In the Apocalypse and in the book of Daniel and in the book of Revelation, the Bible interprets itself, meaning that the symbolism is going to be found in the Scriptures. You don't have to guess about it. You don't have to make something up. The Bible will interpret itself in the symbolism. For example, Christ is called the Lamb because He is a picture of the Passover Lamb from Exodus chapter 12, and He was crucified at near the time of Passover, and He's called the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world in John chapter 1 verse 29. The Satan is the serpent. Why? Because in Genesis chapter 3, a serpent came into the Garden of Eden and tempted Adam and Eve and caused them to sin. The harlot represents a false religion. Why? Because all through the Old Testament, when Israel was given into sin, God said they went into adultery spiritually and they went into whoredoms. That's found, by, for example, in the book of Ezekiel, where Ezekiel is rebuking Israel for their unfaithfulness to God. We find out that if you go to the book of Revelation and you look at the symbols, you will always discover that this, the Bible will interpret what the symbol is. And that symbol, this is, this is what's so neat about it, remains the same throughout the entire scriptures. It's the same thing with biblical Numbers. When you look at the biblical numbers, number three always represents unity. Father, Son, Holy Ghost, faith, hope, and love. Outer court, inner court, holy, uh, holy of holies. Body, soul, and spirit. And it's always the same throughout the Bible. The number four, you have the four corners of the world, which is called the north, south, east, and west, the four points of the compass. We call it four rivers that ran out of the Garden of Eden. Four gospels that deal with the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ. And so the point is that biblical numbers remain the same all throughout the Bible was made on the sixth day. And the number six is the number of man or mankind all the way to Revelation chapter 13 where the Bible says there is a mark of the beast whose number is 666. And so biblical numbers remain the same throughout the Bible and biblical symbolism will always interpret itself. Now, why, do, why does God hide? This is a big question. This needs to be answered. Why does God hide symbolism? Or should I say it this way? Why does he lie, hide in time apocalyptic things in symbolism and doesn't just come right out and make it clear. Proverbs chapter 522 may answer it when it says, it's the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings is to search out a matter. Daniel 12, 21 and 22, he changes the times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom unto the wise, knowledge to them that no understanding. He reveals the deep and secret things. He knows what is in the darkness and the light dwelleth with him. Amos 3 and 7, surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. So why does he hide it? Now, I want everybody to listen to the story I'm going to share with you because I think it's very interesting. Several years ago, I was able to go to Rome, Italy. And I did know that based on just what John said in the book of Revelation chapter 17 about Mystery Babylon, that John said that it was a woman that represented a religious system ruling over the kings of the earth. In John's day, it was the Roman Empire, Imperial Rome, that was ruling over the kings of the earth. So I knew that it was an allusion there in the prophecy to the city of Rome. But as I'm there at a hotel, I've never forgot this, I was meditating, why didn't God John on the Isle of Patmos just simply come out and say, this is Rome. Rome will one day be destroyed. And then I started meditating on it and it's like the Holy Spirit said to me, John was a political prisoner on the Isle of Patmos. John's life would have been taken if he would have said anything negative about Rome. If John would have come out of the Isle of 
Patmos with the book of Revelation with that scroll and it would have said Rome is one day going to be destroyed. Do you realize the Roman authorities would have never left him off of that island? Do you realize the Roman authorities would have said give me that scroll and they would have burned it and thus the book of Revelation would have never been able to get off of the island, would have never been read, would never have been copied and distributed to the churches. Therefore it's significant to understand that one of the reasons I believe that God veiled the understanding of future events like Mystery Babylon in symbolism of a harlot riding a beast is can you imagine when John handed that scroll to the person and says what is this I want to see it and if a Roman authority would have opened it up and they see a dragon in the heaven and a pregnant woman and a beast and with ten horns that it said this guy's been on the island too long get him off and let him out of here and so I believe that God used symbolism oh please listen to this this is significant I believe that God used the symbolism in the book of Revelation to try to hide it from Roman authorities in order to protect so in other words, by God using symbolism, he actually protected the book of Revelation from Roman authorities who would have come in and burnt the book and destroyed the book, and thus we would never have the last book of the, of, the, of the Bible and the last book of the New Testament, which is called the book of Revelation or the Apocalypse. Now, what we're talking about today on Manifest, right here from the city of Jerusalem, this is where we're taping this, is the, is the book of Revelation, and why does God use symbolism? What is the purpose of symbolism? Okay, number one, I believe was to hide the meaning from the Roman leaders to protect the book. Number two, God used symbolism that the ancient people were familiar with. Now, we today may not always understand all of the symbolism that was used in days gone by by the ancient people. However, please understand this, that, that in the Scripture, God used the symbolism that the people of that day were familiar with. Let me give you a couple examples of this today. If I were to say an eagle, what does that symbolize? Immediately, I think... United States. If I were to say a lion, what does that symbolize? What nation? Most of you would think of Great Britain and England. If I were to say a bear, most of you, at least you that are older, would think of the Russia or the so former Soviet Union. If I were to say a Star of David, what nation does it represent? Immediately, if you know anything about it, you'd say Israel. And then if I were to say a great red dragon, what does it represent? You know what? Immediately, if you know your history, if you are in tune with events, you would say it it's a picture of China and you'd be correct in all those so in other words symbolism like that is symbolism that we are familiar with today because we know that the these particular symbols are found in these nations in the time that John wrote the book of Revelation God Almighty used symbolism that the people of that day were very 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 familiar familiar with as a matter of fact when you begin to study the book of Revelation here's what you'll discover that God used cosmic symbols now in the past I did some teaching on this and you know some people don't quite understand what you, what you mean when you say this, but please remember, it was God that created the sun, moon, and stars, not Satan. And according to the book of Genesis, the, star, the sun, moon, and stars are created for signs and seasons. Now, that doesn't mean you worship the stars, and certainly things like astrology and that type of thing are forbidden in the Scripture. However, let's not, let's not throw the baby out with the water. Here's what I mean by that. In the Bible, God uses the emblem of a dragon in the middle of the heavens that's trying to devour the woman before the child is born. In the heavens, there is something called Draco the dragon that sits in the middle of the constellations, and in the heavens, he has his eye on the virgin. Think about that for a moment. And then you find that there's a woman giving birth in the book of Revelation, and there's a constellation called Virgo the virgin, which is found in the heavens. You find there's a lamb with two horns. We discover that there is a symbol of a ram with two horns in the book of Revelation. We find that the Bible in Revelation 12 about the dragon whose tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and, and did cast them out to the earth. There's an emblem of a serpent called Hydra in the heavens, and guess what? From head to tail, it takes up one third of the circuit of heaven. Don't you miss my point. My point is simply this, that God used symbolism even in Revelation, especially there in chapter 12, that we would call today cosmic symbolism. And this cosmic symbolism, what it does is it helps people to understand in that day, because in that day they were much more familiar with cosmic symbolism than
are today because back in that day they depended on the sun moon and stars for the calendar they depended on it for to settle the feast days and they understood all the different things you know comets meant certain dangers and falling stars were read as certain things even according to the ancient Jewish rabbis so we've sort of lost that today because the occult has taken over the understanding of cosmic signs we should not let that happen as believers we should go back to the original intent after all was it not Jacob or Joseph who had the dream of the sun, moon, and stars bowing down before him. And his father said, that's me, your mother, and your brethren. So in other words, the constellations of heaven, the 12 constellations that make up the circuit of heaven, actually are representative, each one, of one of the 12 tribes of Israel. Boy, I don't have time to teach that, but it's a pretty fascinating teaching when you hear it. So the symbolism, let's go back to this. So number three, why does God deal in prophetic symbolism? I believe it's so that the Holy Spirit... A man or woman must lean on and depend upon the Holy Spirit to give you the proper interpretation to what you're reading. Here's some scriptures that concern that. 1 Peter 1.21 The prophecy came not of old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. 2 Timothy 3.16 All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. John 16.13 The Holy Spirit will show you things to come. John 16, 13 also says, He shall guide you into all truth. Remember this, that in the Old Testament time and in the book of Daniel, when Daniel had the, uh, the, the king had the dream, his wise men couldn't interpret anything. It took a man in whom was the Spirit of God. I think the fourth reason, I'll conclude with this, for using symbolism in the book of Daniel, for example, was to conceal the meaning till the time of the end. In Daniel chapter 12 and verse 4, Daniel is told to seal the book to the time of the end, when many would run to and fro and knowledge would be increased. The book is to be sealed until the time of the end. And I believe as we come toward the time of the end, we're going to understand how the gospel can go around the nations, how there can be a mark that can be a universal mark, and also how a city can be destroyed in one hour.